All right, there's some things happening with AI right now. First and foremost, we were supposed to get GPT 5.2 or whatever it was gonna be called today. So that's supposed to be December 9th, but right before the bets on Polymarket completely cratered. Now all the people that are betting are confident that it's coming out Thursday. And if you're wondering if this is insider trading, no, definitely not insider trading. That would be unconscionable. Making a bunch of money trading on insider information, who would do that? Also, Pentagon is ordered to prepare for AGI. So there's a 900 billion defense bill that hits the floor this week. And buried somewhere deep in there is just a few lines, a historic first. By 2026, the Pentagon is required to create a AI futures steering committee. This needs to happen by April 1st, 2026. Its mission will be things like scanning the horizon for various frontier AI model threats, developing protocols for human override capabilities, ensuring that even super intelligent systems can be shut down by humans. In order to prepare, the committee will have to watch both the Terminator 1 and 2 movies, as well as the entire Matrix trilogy. I, I couldn't find a source on that, so that, that might not be real, but, but the rest of this is. And another part of the mission is adversarial defense, assessing the progress of nations like China and Russia towards AGI, and formulating strategies to defend against their potential AGI systems. Grok 420 is coming likely this year, so coming in about three weeks, and then Grok 420 five in a few months, according to Elon Musk. And the news, we might see SpaceX IPO sometime soon. This hasn't been confirmed, but there are talks by some big publications in the financial space that this might happen as soon as next year. XAI hackathon has come to an end. Lots of people built a lot of really cool stuff. One thing in particular got people outraged. And also President Trump announces his one rule book to rule them all, or at least one rule book for AI, as opposed to having all the 50 states have their own sometimes conflicting contributions to AI regulation. So as you might well know, the current administration is a very AI accelerationist. We've talked about the Genesis mission. So this is to accelerate AI for scientific discoveries, partnerships between the federal government, a lot of the best universities and frontier AI labs. It seems like a lot of the Frontier AI labs will, as part of this deal, get access to a lot of federal data, high quality data sets that just might not be available anywhere else. We also have the Pentagon getting ready for EGI, like we talked about, a potential compute build out that is somehow supported or encouraged by the federal government, Amazon to invest up to 50 billion to build out infrastructure for US government. There's talks about treating this like the Manhattan Project, but for AI. And finally, this executive order that will put more power to regulate in the hands of the government versus the states. And as you might imagine, it's not without controversy. So hit that thumbs up button so we get this out to more people and uh, let's dive in. There were some uh, rumors and whispers about potentially a SpaceX IPO target for mid-2026. Potential valuation of this is near or around $1.5 trillion. Why, you might ask, well... AI data centers in space. Now, really fast, I did some checks on this because in the past, I think Elon Musk said that he's not planning an IPO, or at least he denied the rumors at the time. I've recently been running a lot of my stuff through Gemini 3 because it's, it's really good. It's getting really good at double checking certain things, finding inaccuracies, etc. Let me know if you feel the same way. Have you been using Gemini 3 a lot more? I'm noticing that it also is pretty good at summarizing YouTube videos. Don't don't think about summarizing my videos. Listen to me, but the other videos, uh, try summarizing them with Gemini 3. It's getting pretty good at it. But some major financial outlets, including Bloomberg, suggest that SpaceX is making preliminary preparations for its IPO, initial public offering, so meaning that it's going to be listed to be sold as a stock on the stock market, and that's coming mid to late 2026. So again, like I mentioned, in the past, Musk has denied that it's going IPO. He set some conditions, so we're not sure exactly what's happening, or at least it's important to keep in mind these counterpoints. Now, you might know Kathy Wood of ARK Invest. She recently open sourced her evaluation tool for SpaceX. So in a collaboration with Mac33, ARK Invest open sourced its SpaceX model, the only open source model in the market, if she's not mistaken, which should help put into perspective the massive opportunities even before solar powered data centers in space. So what are they valuing SpaceX at? Again, without taking into consideration the AI data centers in space, 
Well, the bull case is 3.1 trillion. Remember when Dr. Evil goes to the future and he's like, I want $1 billion. And everybody just like laughs at him like, what? You want a billion dollars? Let me see if we can get that from the, the pocket change that we have here. That's what it feels like. So 3.1 trillion, the base expected value, 2.5 trillion. Interestingly, Elon Musk does comment on her post saying the following, a major additional factor should be considered. Satellites with localized AI compute, where just the results are beamed back from a low latency sun synchronous orbit will be the lowest cost to generate AI bitstreams in less than three years. And by far the fastest way to scale within four years because every sources of electrical power are already hard to find on Earth. One megaton per year of satellites with 100 kilowatt per satellite yields 100 gigawatt of AI added per year with no operating or maintenance cost connecting via high bandwidth lasers to the Starlink constellation. The level beyond that is constructing satellite factories on the moon and using a mass driver. Electromagnetic railgun to accelerate AI satellites to lunar escape velocity without the need for rockets. That scales to greater than 100 terawatt per year of AI and enables non-trivial progress towards becoming a Kardashev to civilization. What does that mean? Well, this is from an idea by Nikolai Semyonovich Kardashev and the Kardashev scale. So basically you can think of a civilization as being on one of the rungs of sort of technological advancement. And we're basically measuring it in terms of how much energy they need to run that civilization. So a type one planetary sort of level is where we, we use all energy available on our home planet, you know, the weather, the oceans, etc. And a type two is, is the stellar level where we can harness all energy output from our star, right? So using a Dyson spheres or something like that. Type three is galactic controlled energy on a galactic scale using resources from its entire galaxy. There are more levels, but we're not going to go there today. I think this is enough. We're, we're, we're trying to get to level two. So we're trying to speed run to Kardashev scale level two. Now in the comments, I'm seeing tons of people kind of making fun of this idea, not just on, on this post, but, but many others. I think Nvidia recently was one of the first ones to kind of start talking about it. A lot of people made fun of it, or at least the reception wasn't that good. But then of course, recently, you know, we have Elon Musk talking about Jeff Bezos mentioned something, but to me, the people that provided the most kind of clarity are, uh, on whether or not this is happening inside soon was, was actually Google. We covered this in a previous video, link it down below if you want to see it. It's from Google's research. They published a paper on it. It's called Project Suncatcher. And they basically went through and decided to figure out how possible it is, how viable it is to run these uh, constellations of solar powered AI data centers in a sun synchronous orbit. What is a sun synchronous orbit? Basically you're flying in an orbit that provides the same lighting condition, right? So you can imagine there's a certain orbits where the, the sun sort of changes its position relative to where you are. It changes the lighting conditions change for sun synchronous orbits. It doesn't change Google's project. Starcatcher specifically is going to be at the dawn dusk line. So they're saying he likely operating in a dawn dusk sun synchronous low earth orbit where it would be exposed to near constant sunlight. So it's much more efficient to collect the solar rays, convert them into electricity up there. There's no atmosphere, so they don't bounce off. There's no humidity, there's no clouds, and it's never nighttime if you're in the right orbit. And so in this paper, they actually break down the things that would make this impossible and how close are we to, to fixing it? How, how viable is it? We can't have any one of the data centers be too heavy. The heavier it is, the, I mean, creates tons of problems with maneuverability, how hard it is to, to get up there. So of course you might know that, for example, for those GPUs, the NVIDIA chips, the, the transfer between the different chips has to be very, very fast. So it has to have a, a very high bandwidth. Can we achieve the same thing in space? So what Google is testing is to have a constellation of these AI powered satellites that are communicating through space lasers. And they found that this has a high enough bandwidth to transmit data back and forth to where this will work. They do have to fly in a fairly tight formation, but that doesn't seem to be a problem. So they, they did find that they're able to kind of keep them all 
clustered close enough to where this is an issue and you don't need too many uh, adjustments to keep it steady. So space lasers check, you know, flying in close formation in a constellation check. Now, isn't the equipment just gonna get fried by the radiation? They tested it and they found that the amount of radiation that these things will soak up over a five year period, which is kind of like the, the total mission time is much less than kind of like the level at which these things start tripping out and producing wrong results, et cetera. So radiation, not a problem. In fact, TPUs are surprisingly radiation hard for space applications. The only problem is right now it's too expensive to get stuff up there. Basically, we need a price that is about $200 per kg. At that point, this uh, magical thing begins to happen where it's actually the same amount of money to build data centers in space as it is to build them here on the planet's surface with electricity, et cetera, et cetera. So if you were to, to build a, a project with a data center, electricity, et cetera, and then kind of analyze how much it costs you to generate electricity per, per year at 200 per kilo to send stuff into a low Earth orbit, it's the same expense to build this stuff in space. Are we close to that number? Well, not quite yet, but if we assume that things get as good as they have been, like that learning rate continues, we should get there by mid 2030s. By the way, Elon Musk is saying, you know, he's quoting less than three years. So is it, you know, in 10 years, is it three years? Who's closer? We don't know, but notice none of those numbers are that far in the future. So let me know what you think about that. Do you think first and foremost that SpaceX will IPO next year or sometime if in the next one or two years? And if so, do you see it as a big opportunity? Some more news out of XAI. They just had a hackathon for 24 hours and revealed some of the top most interesting projects that people have created. One of them was this halftime app that dynamically weaves AI generated ads into the scenes you're watching. So breaks feel like they're part of the story instead of interruptions. Pretty cool thing that somebody just managed to hack up in, you know, a day or so. And this would have been a good story in and of itself, I feel like, but Futurism and, and other publications, you know, journalists uh, are saying Elon Musk's XAI says it can now stuff AI generated product placement into any scene of your favorite movie. In an announcement, Elon Musk's AI company XAI unveiled a new tool called Halftime. None of this is true. They are, as always, making stuff up. It was just an app that somebody put together using XAI technology. This isn't XAI that developed it. It's not part of Elon Musk's strategy. It was these three people that created it for this project. Some of the other projects from the hackathon were Grok Play, where you can enjoy and create multiplayer games, climb the leaderboards, an X feed for coding agents, an AI recruitment platform that sources top engineering talent via X using Grok analysis, multi-dimensional scoring, and NLQ, Haggle, an anonymous agent that calls on your behalf and that uses smart negotiation tactics to secure the best deals. Emergency intelligence platform that verifies and quickly summarizes incidents from X. This looks kind of cool if you're able to kind of in real time and get real time updates with specific locations and also have it be verified. This would be very useful and also built by veterinarians that help you understand your cow's health, nutrition, and various other metrics. AI dairy consultant. I'm glad they didn't call it something like a legendary, you know, with the AI in it, legendary. Tons and tons of other ones. Check it out. I'll link this one down below. There's some pretty cool projects in here. This is such a cool story on its own. Why not cover it? Why not make it positive? This is a people building, creating, sharing. Shouldn't this be the news? Why corrupt it? Why tear it down? Why, why twist it to make it negative about XAI? I'll get off my soapbox now. One big piece of news here in the US is this one rulebook for AI. And of course, everybody has their own opinion about how this should be handled. And there's kind of a sharp conflict around it. Congress failed to pass a ban on states being able to regulate. And so this is now an executive order that is planned to be signed. The one rule executive order that is basically saying that the federal government will be in charge of regulating AI. So this is David Sachs, he's the AI czar. So obviously people will be very divided on whether or not they agree with what he's saying here, but here's his case for why it should be controlled at the federal level. 
So when he's saying when an AI model is developed in state A, trained in state B, inferenced in state C, and delivered over the internet through, you know, national communications all over the place, this is a clearly interstate commerce and exactly the type of economic activity that the framers of the Constitution intended to reserve for the federal government to regulate. If each state produces policies and regulations, there could be a lot of different confusing, conflicting regulations. Already, we have over 1,200 bills that were introduced and over 100 measures that have already passed. In states like Colorado, California, California, and Illinois, the AI developers would be liable if the models contribute to algorithmic discrimination, which is defined as having a disparate impact on the protected group. And his point here is that AI models should strive for truth and be ideologically unbiased. At best, we'll end up with 50 different AI models for 50 different states. This will esteem innovation, especially for small startups. Meanwhile, China will race ahead. And as President Trump announced today, we need one rule book for AI. Some of the concerns that people have raised are covered here. So for child safety, the existing and generally applicable state laws regarding that and online platforms, they would still be in effect. Communities AI preemption would not apply to local infrastructure. This would not force communities to host data centers they don't want. The copyright law is already federal, so there's no need for preemption here. The question about how copyright laws will be applied to the AIs, it's already being played out in courts, and that's where the issue will be decided. And as he's saying here, number four, censorship. As I mentioned, the biggest threat of censorship is coming from certain blue states. Red states can't stop this. Only federal leadership can. I'm going to put up a poll. Please vote if you have a second. I'll link it down below whether or not you think it should be federal government that has the most power for stuff like this or the states. And I don't mean the, the current administration or not. I just mean in general, right? So moving forward, do you prefer it sort of kind of more top down or distributed uh, on a state level? This is mostly probably for U.S. people, but anyone, please feel free to vote. I think creators, communities, child safety, these are not that controversial. I think most people will be okay with this, I, I think. I'm sure this is a censorship thing that's going to have a lot of controversy around it, but he's saying there's also the fifth sort of area of concern, and that is competitiveness. If we want America to win the AI race, a confusing patchwork of regulation will not work. There must be only one rule book if we are to going to continue to lead in AI. We are beating all countries at this point in the race, but that won't last long if we're going to have 50 states, many of them bad actors involved in rules and the approval process. Scrolling through Twitter a few weeks ago, I guess, I noticed this is kind of a jumped out at me. So this is Max Tegmark saying, if you support the new push to ban state AI regulation, please watch this before making up your mind. I just joined Megan on this episode and it really shook me up, motivating me to fight even harder against this evil. And he's quoting Bannon's War Room here, and he does appear on this episode as well. So I haven't seen it yet. I do plan to, and we're also planning to reach out and try to maybe get people kind of talking about this on the podcast to maybe get some details and their thoughts on the subject. Now, I hope if you've been watching my channel, I'm not here to push my opinion or my worldview. I tried to the best of my ability to kind of give both sides of the story. So I do want to make sure that I kind of cover both sides here. I will admit I'm very biased here. I used to run an e-commerce business that would sell to all 50 states and then sometimes also abroad. At some point, the U.S. introduced a Fairness Act or it was called something like that, basically where you had to start paying the sales tax on all the products sold anywhere, no matter where you were in the country. You had to start paying sales tax to every state. All of a sudden, you had to know 50 different laws from 50 different states about how to pay sales tax. You had to create an account with them, figure out how to pay it to log in and keep up. The whole thing was a mess. Not because we had to start paying sales tax. It was because complying with 50 different states with different laws was e extremely challenging. So it wasn't the, the law or the payment that was the problem, but just the fact that 50 different states had 50 different slightly written laws and slightly different payments and taxes and ways to go about them. That was an issue. And also the same thing was for, for example, for California that introduced this idea of kill switches for AI models where developers would be liable, maybe even criminally liable if they couldn't turn off their model after releasing it, which basically meant the death of open source. So I can definitely see how having the states decide everything could be a nightmare. But obviously, the opposite could be just as bad as complete top-down control. That could obviously result in overreach, etc. Especially here, where I think a lot of people will have, as they say here, an iceberg of a bipartisan populist fury. Because the president traditionally cannot preempt state laws without explicit authorization from Congress. 
authorization the Senate just refused to give. So this one will be kind of a tough to decide. I think at the very minimum, we need to have states keep some of the regulations and powers that they have. Had the federal government try to create some top-down laws that everyone can agree on and kind of just at least enforce those, try to prevent any conflicting laws. I mean, if California wants staying and Texas has a just the exact opposite, that is a problem. Specifically, if the pressure's on the actual labs, on the developers to choose one or the other. But let me know what you think and uh, vote in the poll below. I'm very curious how people are, are viewing this.